Okay, perfect. Everyone's in. Thank you, Claire. Um, good morning, all. Um, we will start. Hi, Mary. Um, I will start our um, online event this morning. Um, people will automatically admit it. Um, this is recorded just for your information, but um, we will start now. I thank you all. Good morning for joining us in um, this beautiful uh, morning, sunny outside, Zoom inside, and have a great conversation this morning. Um, for the people who don't know, we're working in partnership with Wealthy Hera. We're a homegrown uh, club in Marlebone, center of London. We are a club for entrepreneurs there, and that's why this talk is so um, yeah, relevant. A couple of entrepreneurs for in, um, and investors and business leaders who come together and yeah, learn and building long lasting relationships. And we have set this uh, relationship up as well with Wealthier Network. Um, over the last um, month, we had some great events. And Prashima, I would like you to, yeah, if you could introduce the speakers of today. And thank you again for organizing it this morning. Absolutely. Thank you, Juice. And good morning. Thank you. Good morning. And thank you to Homegrown for hosting our third event in the series. We're fortunate today to welcome Dawn Lee Wan Po, Executive Director, Senior Portfolio Manager at Julius Baer, who will be in conversation with Merrilee Carr, award-winning founder of the celebrated business under the doormat. It is our absolute pleasure as the Wealthy Her Network to be a part of today's discussions, which promise to be insightful and also very timely. For those of you that don't know us, the network launched in 2019 with 13 founding partners, including Julius Baer, and it leverages the power of collaborative action, bringing together leading businesses, the media and influencers to drive the empowerment and economic advancement of women. Together, we work to arm and equip women with the knowledge and confidence they need to prosper and build a better future. This month, following our research with thousands of women and men, in the UK and Asia, we launched our key findings into personal and entrepreneurial wealth, which gives valuable insights into women and men's financial confidence attitudes to and needs around money, workplace and equality. A couple of interesting facts to frame our conversation today. Women's wealth will grow to 93 trillion by 2023. Career success and entrepreneurship are two of the key drivers of this growth. Um, while female entrepreneurs are more challenged than ever before, um, and this is because of the double impact of the care burden and the economic crisis, it has taken its toll on female entrepreneurs, with funding remaining the biggest barrier to growth and survival. However, COVID has fueled a new intent for women to start businesses. Women are showing a higher intent than men to start businesses as a result, particularly between the ages of 25 and 45. And it is those turnaround traits that will see women through. So we're looking forward to learning from Merrily's experiences of moving from startup to scale up, how she has adapted to these wonderfully weird and financially challenging times and how her work with the STAA and bringing social impact into her business is a force for good. So I'll now hand over to Dawn, champion of female empowerment and huge advocate of our movement and mission. Dawn, it's over to you. Thank you. Good morning, all. It's an absolute pleasure to be speaking to Merrily this morning. Uh, let's start from the beginning of your journey. You know, following 13 years of working at Shell and then founding Under the Doormat in 2014. Uh, you know, very much um, at a time where Airbnb was also really taken off in London. How did uh, Under the Doormat differentiate itself? Yeah, so I think for me, when I decided to leave the corporate world and set up a business, um, I was looking at what were the businesses where I saw opportunities for growth and change, where disruption was happening. Um, and back in, in 2013, 2014, you had just the emergence of Airbnb starting to become a concept. And, you know, Airbnb is peer to peer. So that's where, you know, they, they provide a platform and individuals who have a place to rent and people who are looking for a place to rent get matched up. Uh, but what I realized was, especially at the high end of the market, the people who have wonderful homes that they might be willing to, to rent out to people when they're not using them, those people do not want to be changing linens and uh, meeting guests and you know all these types of things. They don't want to be B&B hosts. They actually want someone else to take care of it for them. And equally, high-end guests want to know that it's professionally managed, um, you know, not just something on the side that somebody may be good at or may not be good at. Um, 
And I had, of course, my own personal experiences. Um, I got into triathlon back around that time. And uh, I traveled with some friends to Lausanne for a race. And we booked a home, which was not that easy to find. You know, it, it, you know, you can always find holiday homes in resort destinations or in the mountains when you go skiing. But to find one in a city was still pretty hard. Um, and so we found one. But when we arrived, the owner's uh, cleaner hadn't shown up. The house wasn't clean. They never mentioned in, in the listing that we'd be cat sitting as well. Um, and so just the whole experience, I was like, well, you know, we want to book and pay for a nice home to stay in, but we want a nice experience um, and a professional experience. And so on both sides of the coin, what I realized is that for this industry to grow and reach its full potential, it needed to be professionalized and there needed to be a company in the heart of it all um, with a brand that consumers could trust. Um, and that was really where Under the Doormat came about. Great, you know, great proposition. And talking about the brand, how did you build that brand and how important were social media channels back then versus today? <laughs> Um, so I think building the brand fundamentally comes from always consistently delivering great experience. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that's difficult is that, you know, you don't build a brand overnight. It's actually something that takes a bit of time and you have to build trust and confidence in, in the product that you're delivering. Um, you know, back then, social media, we had accounts and, and we did a lot of that um, from the start. But I think it's really only in the past couple of years where you start to see that kind of snowball effect and that social media really has a, a bigger part to play in it. Um, I think interestingly, what we found is that actually LinkedIn is, is increasingly an important channel for us um, compared to, you know, people love us on Instagram because we've got beautiful homes and, you know, all the wonderful London experiences and things like that. Um, but what we found is that, especially with, uh, with my industry hat on, because I chair the industry body, the Short-Term Accommodation Association, um, talking about the business issues, talking about our industry, um, that's what really engages people. And that's driven, um, you know, interest in the company, not just from a point of view of, oh, I'm a guest and I want to stay, but also investment into the business um, and, you know, let's say interest in business to business type transactions for some of our new business models, et cetera. So I think for us, it's been interesting to see that the business conversation has driven more interest in the company from a social media perspective than, you know, just those wonderful pictures that everyone loves to see. But I, I still think social media is, it, it's a difficult channel to convert business. Um, mm -hmm. It's great that people love you, but how do you really convert that into actual sales? Um, and so most of the other founders that I talk to also would, would tend to agree. Social media is almost a must have. Mm -hmm. You need to have your brand out there. People need to know who you are. Um, but, you know, you really have to see it as more brand building uh, because you'll have other channels which are going to drive much more ROI in terms of sales. And I guess just talking about building your brand and building that business from the start, how early on did you bring in a board of advisors? You know, we've got some great people on that board. Um, can you take us through that journey and, and how much you were sort of relied on your own network back then? Uh, I mean, look, I relied very heavily on my own network. And I think some people sort of say to me, oh, you know, you worked in Shell for 13 years. Don't you wish you became an entrepreneur earlier in your career? Mm -hmm. Um, and actually, my answer to that is absolutely not. I mean, two reasons why. One, I think it's really important to, you know, to learn. I, I, I had great opportunities in the corporate world um, to manage businesses globally. Um, and I think in some ways, I sometimes talk about how it makes me a bit of a reverse entrepreneur because the larger my business grows, the more that I find myself back into my comfort zone of the things that I used to do. You know, I, I manage the maintenance of 12,000 petrol sites across 43 countries. And one day, I hope under the doormat will be a brand which is around the world as well. So um, I think if you want to be a CEO of your business and run your business in the longer term, you need to have experience, which you're only ever going to get from working in a company that's already larger. Um, and so when it comes to discussions with lawyers, when it comes to discussions about contracts, 
um, you know, I've had that experience in a previous life. And I think that helps a lot to build a solid business. Um, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs are really great at the idea and getting off the ground, testing, learning, that sort of thing. Um, but then when it comes to building in the processes, the systems, the robustness of the business, it really helps to have had that experience in a company that, of course, has done that very, very well. Um, but I think in terms of your earlier question, you know, when, um, sorry, I've just lost the train of thought back to the original question. Just in terms of building that sort of board of advisor, how early on did you bring them in? So actually, even before I launched the company, um, so okay. most of them, I mean, we have had board of advisors who've come on throughout our journey, but you know, the core of the board was was there helping me to build the business case from the day one. So they were the people that I went to and said, oh, look, you're the person that I know who knows more about technology than anyone else in the world. Wow. That was Ben. Um, and so when I had the idea, I went to Ben and I said, Ben, I've got this idea. Can I buy you lunch and pick your brains about technology and how that might work in my business plan? And so I had a couple of lunches with him. I shared the ideas. He helped me to, to frame the technology side of the business plan. Um, and what was great about it was that as soon as I then said, okay, well, I've really got to make a decision now. Am I going to do this? Mm -hmm. Or is it just a business plan on paper? Um, and he just said, you absolutely should do this. This is a, a brilliant idea. Um, and by the way, I want to be involved. And that's basically what happened, you know, with Warren, who has been on my board from the finance side, um, with Ed, who helped us come up with the Under the Doormat brand in the early days, with uh, James, who's our legal advisor, um, who actually helped come up with the whole structure of our contract with our owners um, and having it be a license to occupy, um, which is a very different structure yeah. that I knew nothing about before I launched the company. And, and so I think what's been great then is they all invested in the company. So, you know, they put their own money in. They said, we really believe in this. We want to make it happen. And we're going to be on that journey with you. Um, and that's been incredible because... I'm a sole founder. Some people have co-founders. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have the right person at that time to be a co-founder with me. And I really wanted to start the business. Uh, but having that board behind me has made all the strategic decisions along the way so much easier because I have the expertise that I need at that strategic level for all the different areas that are important for a business um, and their investors. So they know what results we need to get because they're yeah. shareholders themselves and they want to see those results themselves. Um, and so I think that that for me was a great way to get engagement at a strategic level early on um, and also to have their buy-in. So no, no person on my board is not an investor um, and mm -hmm. they don't get their shares for free. They've actually bought their shares in, in various rounds throughout. Um, and, you know, I know that's not how a lot of people do it. A lot of um, NEDs want shares for free or they want, you know, various different structures where they get paid. And, and that isn't how we work because I think our interests are absolutely aligned. Um, and I think that that drives the right uh, behaviors for everyone, um, knowing that everyone's in it together and we've all invested in it. I guess, well, that's a great segue into funding, you know, I guess um, on a more topical area, there have been, you know, it's sort of well known that the fraction of VC funding goes to all female founder teams. You know, I think there's research out there, it's as low as 1%. But with that, how was your experience as a female entrepreneur? And what approach, you know, you've discussed already your approach in the early days. How has that evolved going forward, whether it's crowdfunding, annual investors, VCs, but if you can just take us through that journey, that'd be great. Yeah, so I think for us, I made the choice pretty early on that we didn't want to go down the VC route. Um, and I think that's actually really important to have clear what your strategy is. I wanted to build a sustainably profitable business. And I wanted to make sure that, you know, while we we will likely sell out at some stage to, uh, you know, to a larger company um, and get really great returns on investment, I didn't want our strategy to be driven by VCs and the VC funnel, you know, your series A, your series mm -hmm. B, you know, you've got to hit certain growth metrics, 
and that they only really look for one in 10 to succeed. Um, I wanted investors who would bring strategic guidance to the business and also um, introductions. Um, so most of our investors are angels. We have also some family offices. Um, and I think for us, that's been really good because everyone who's invested in the business has often brought additional value to the business. Um, to give one example, Derek Gamage, who is chairman of CBRE Hotels and who sits on our board, he's one of our largest investors. Um, he made an introduction to us, which led to the recent launch of the Three Sloan Gardens uh, mm -hmm. building with Cadogan Estates. You know, that's the sort of thing where, you know, as a very young business, getting into very established companies like Cadogan Estates is a challenge and introductions help with that. Um, and so I think having that sort of investor who really wants to help us grow the business has been critical. We have also done crowdfunding. And I think the reason why we did that is because as a consumer business, it can also be really important to get, um, you know, the types of consumers that might enjoy your business, in our case, as a homeowner. So having properties that they want to rent out or, you know, having people who come and visit them in London uh frequently so having them as as kind of ambassadors to the business can also be really good um but i think the key about crowdfunding is that's never really your your central route to raising money mm -hmm. it's just something you do on the side often if there's a pr value and having a wider network of in investors in the community um to to really have a sense a kind of a group of ambassadors um, but I think we are also now at a stage, especially with the launch of Hosperia, which is our tech arm, um, and also um, this year with the launch of Trusted Stays, that we will be looking for more serious funding um, and looking for a Series A round in 2021. Um, and so we will be looking at more institutional type investment. Um, but again, we want to be looking for a bit longer term capital mm -hmm. um, and, and not just uh, your typical VC. Um, and so I think that's where, you know, finding the right investors for your strategy is really important so that you've got those aligned interests and, um, and you don't find yourself several years down the road actually feeling that you've had to sell your business too soon because that's what the VC wanted. And you've been so successful raising funding from angel investors to the crowdfunding and also with the UK Future Fund. You know, give us your the details about that and how you actually came about knowing about it. Was that, you know, through your own learnings or again, through guidance? Um, I think I've been really lucky. There are so many great networks out there for entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm a member of the Supper Club, which is um, a, a group of CEOs of, of high growth companies. Um, and so you can learn from other entrepreneurs who've already been very successful in, in what they've delivered. Um, you know, also being a part of the industry body, the Short Term Accommodation Association. I know all the other founders of the other companies in my sector. And of course, you can mm -hmm. share learnings. Um, so I think having those networks is, is critical. And, and Homegrown is obviously a great example of how people can join a network, um, can learn from other founders, because especially if you're a, a sole founder, you know, there's no way you're going to learn it all yourself. Um, yeah. And I think it's sometimes just so important to have a chat with someone who's already done something and say, how did you do that? And you might have then two or three introductions that you can go away and act on that immediately deliver results. Um, and I think that that's been really, really helpful for me. I think in terms of fundraising, I mean, I obviously had never done it before. I came from the corporate world. So when I had a venture inside Shell, you pitched to a board, they made the decision and you got the money. Um, and it doesn't work that way in the entrepreneurial <laughs> world, unfortunately. Um, but I think, you know, it has been hard and I'm not going to pretend that raising money is easy. You know, these stories where, oh, you know, it was overfunded in, in two hours and all this stuff. I can just tell you that's not what happens in the background. Those are the stories that people love to portray externally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most uh, advisors will tell you that you need to plan six to 12 months to raise your money. Um, and that it's a hard uh, one route to, to, to getting there. So only take money if you need it. You know, if there are other ways to grow your business without needing to raise investment, 
of course, think about that because if you are going to raise investment, it is going to take a significant portion of your time. And I think that's one thing to know because you can't go at it half-heartedly. If you go out on a raise, you've got to succeed. Um, and so that that's uh, one thing to know and make sure that you're prepared when you do. Um, I think for me, you know, we talk about female entrepreneurs and raising and, you know, we've got a mix of male uh, investors, female investors, and they're incredible. But I'm not going to lie in saying that I've never felt discrimination. I mean, there are times when my CFO, who's a male, um, you know, I'd be sitting in a meeting and they would address all the questions to him. Um, you know, there have been, <laughs> you know, this kind of scenarios where you just know what's going on. Yeah. And you can't say anything. You just have to be positive. Um, okay. And then you have to think, well, you know, there are great investors out there who believe in female founders and who believe in our resilience and our capability. And so, you know, you're just going to find the investors who fit you. And mm -hmm. people aren't going to invest in your business if they don't believe in a female founder because they want to invest in people. And I think that's the thing at the end, you know, whether it's being a female, whether, you know, whether it's your age, whatever other thing it may be, the reality is investors invest in people who they believe in. And if you don't have that connection with an investor, they're unlikely to invest their money. So I think it's just about finding the right investors and spending the time on the people who believe in you. Um, because you're not going to win every battle, no matter what that battle is. Um, and so I think, you know, just don't spend time on the people who, who don't take you seriously. That is a great advice. Um, just, I guess, going back to the business and, and the exciting phase of expansion, um, it'll be really interesting to hear you touched on Hospira, maybe just for the audience, a brief of explanation of that. And also an understanding, was that ever part of your initial plan or has this evolved over time? Yeah, so Hosperia is our tech arm, as I mentioned, and it, it isn't the initial idea of the company. I mean, we uh, we built a brand to be that, um, you know, the, the quality of a hotel and the comfort of a home. And our plan was to deliver that ourselves. Uh, but what we realized over time is there are a lot of small providers out there who don't have the technology and who provide that great local experience, that quality in, in the delivery. Um, across Europe, just as an example, there are more than 20,000 property managers who have less than 100 properties in their portfolio. So the market's huge, um, but actually those guys need the technology that we built to deliver what we wanted to for under the doormat. Um, and so we realized that actually offering to them that technology was a way for us to scale and grow the brand and to grow our, our proposition um, geographically without having to have boots on the ground everywhere mm -hmm. that we wanted to operate. And at the same time, we're actually helping the industry to stay independent and to still provide those authentic local experiences. Um, and to help those entrepreneurs grow their businesses because they can focus on what they're good at, which is bringing on board new homeowners in their local area and providing great guest experiences. Um, and we can do that technology and the reservations and booking management for them so that they don't need to all of a sudden become a technology expert. Um, and so that's the, the Hosperia model. We've launched it this summer and I, I I have to say we couldn't have had a better time because of course the mm -hmm. industry is going through a very difficult period um, with lockdowns all around Europe and, and around the world. Um, and a lot of these small businesses are struggling. Um, they don't have the resource. They know they need to modernize and, and to implement technology into their business, um, but they don't know where to begin. And they certainly don't know how to build together all the different technologies because in our industry, you need channel management, you need property management, you need field management, you need pricing management. It's all these things. And on the back end, you've got to stitch them all together. You know, for a small business who might have a team of five or 10 people, um, they don't have the people who have that expertise to do that. And they certainly don't have the power with all of the technology providers to build those APIs because they're not even going to mm -hmm. they're not even going to surface on the radar of that list. Um, and equally, you know, we have a partnership with Marriott Homes and Villas. Um, and they recognized that they had, for example, a lot of small companies who want to get onto Marriott Homes and Villas. 
and they've got a minimum of 100 properties to even consider them as a partner. Um, and so we're the first company where any company that chooses to work with us can get on to Marriott Homes and Villas, even if they only have 10 or 20 properties. Um, and so it's great to see how you can work with large companies like Marriott, um, with the technology providers, and you can package up something and actually be the solution for all the small providers in the industry to help them have a solution to how, how to grow their businesses as well. It's, it's great that you've been able to successfully build these partnerships. Um, you've just mentioned with Marriott, you've also mentioned earlier uh, with Three Stone Gardens. Like with that, how crucial is building that partnership as part of your overall long-term strategy? And how do you envisage that going forward? Yeah, I think one thing that's really important, and actually I spoke to another entrepreneur when I was initially starting out and, you know, and he advised me, he said, be really clear about what it is that you're delivering um, and be clear what you're not doing. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's actually really, really important. Um, you know, early days, um, I'm, I'm not joking. I literally was wheeling suitcases around with linens to the first couple of houses that we were trialing in the pilot. Um, and I realized very quickly that I didn't want to be in the laundry business. Um, and so I spent a lot of time in my first few months to find our right laundry partner. Um, and I feel really lucky because we found Laundry Heap. They were also a young company that was just starting out. And the founder and I, till this day, you know, meet regularly to, to discuss the challenges of, of growing our businesses. Um, and that's been a really crucial partnership for us. Um, and I think whatever it is, whether it is finding suppliers who are going to do certain aspects of what your delivery might be, um, whether it is partnerships for growth. So as we grow and we don't now just work with individual owners, we also work with companies like Cadogan. Um, we work with um, other estate agents and, and, and other property companies who see short term rentals as an opportunity for them, but they don't you know, they don't have the capability to do that themselves. Um, and I think having a, a clear partnership strategy of where are the areas that you want to find other companies mm. you can work with, um, and then reaching out and building those relationships, I think is critical to scale up growth. Um, it can be easy in the startup phase to do everything yourself and feel like you need to have that control. But I think that prevents you from then being able to scale up because you aren't going to be able to scale up your your laundry and scale up your cleaning mm -hmm. and scale up your uh, homeowner growth and scale up all these things simultaneously. And so finding partners who can do those certain aspects very well and that you trust means that you can focus on scaling up your part um, and you know that the other parts will scale up without effort from you and your team. Um, and I think that's critical because otherwise you will constantly be hitting um, kind of break points in your supply chain uh, if you try and do everything yourself. And, and I guess building on that, the theme of, I guess, collaboration, you know, turning to this year, your sector faced unprecedented headwinds, uh, but yet under the doormat made a very honorable pledge to help key home workers. Can you give us some introduction uh, in terms of the NHS homes program yeah so i mean to be honest it's one of these things it actually was an idea that that came about um because of conversations with some of our partners and what we realized was that you know because of the lockdown there were lots of homes that were sitting empty in our portfolio and everyone else in the industry um and so there are two options i mean one is you know you just say okay great we're just going to wait for for the industry to come back and we'll just kind of shut her up until then um and we sort of said well hold on a second at the same time actually the nhs is under unprecedented um pressure um and we started hearing stories of nhs workers getting thrown out of their apartments because their flatmates felt unsafe um landlords you know asking them to leave and actually the one that really struck me was um when we started hearing about um nhs workers doctors nurses who had vulnerable family members at home 
and who were actually afraid that they were going to, you know, to give COVID to mm -hmm. vulnerable people in their family because of their work. Um, I mean, we we launched the program and one of our first uh, NHS workers was a doctor at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital whose wife was going through cancer treatment. Um, and he needed a place to stay so that he wasn't going to potentially expose her. Um, and those are the kinds of stories where you just say, look, we have to do something. Mm -hmm. um, and so as under the doormat, we created the scheme and immediately I took it to the rest of the industry um, in my star role. And, uh, and everyone was incredibly supportive. We had more than 30 companies, including companies like One Fine Stay, uh, Sykes, uh, which is, of course, across the entire UK. Um, and so we had more than 1500 homes which were offered out to NHS workers and we delivered more than 20 million pounds of stays uh, for free. And I think that was kind of incredible when our industry was going through such a tough time. Um, but then what was really interesting was to see the opportunity that came out of it, which we had no idea of from the, from, from the outset. Um, and that was that in our conversations with government, we realized there was an opportunity to offer homes to government workers forever into the future. Mm -hmm. In the past, they pay for hotels if they need a hotel, but in many cases, homes are a better solution for them. Um, and so we're now in the process of actually becoming a supplier to government through the Crown Commercial Service. Um, and that opportunity came about because of the, you know, the, the kind of CSR stuff that we chose to do. And, you know, we didn't do it because of that, but I think doing the right thing always leads to good opportunities. Um, and it, it's great to see how that has led to an opportunity where people understand our industry better and they understand that it isn't just peer to peer. There is a professional side to our sector um, and that we do provide standards. We do provide quality in just the same way that hotels do. Um, and I think that's been it's great that government started to see that. I think corporates are starting to see that in, in the bookings that we're taking at the moment, uh, where consumers are now choosing to stay in homes rather than hotels, because we're actually seen as a safer option, but only when it's professionally managed. Mm -hmm. I guess talking about those trends, you know, and the wider industry, do you think going forward sort of post COVID your customer mix is going to fundamentally change in terms of the mix between leisure versus corporate? I mean, I think it's already happening. And, you know, uh, Goldman Sachs did a study in North America a couple of years ago, which showed that once people stayed in homes, they often, their preferences changed. And that was often their, their first choice over a hotel. Um, and I think that's what we're seeing. I think COVID has accelerated that pace of change. Uh, prior to COVID, our industry was growing at 30% year on year and was projected to be a 52 billion pound industry in the UK by 2025. Um, and I think what's happening this year is we're seeing our sector recover quicker. Um, as an industry, we work with STR, which provides hospitality industry data. Um, and in the first couple of months that we've piloted in London, we're seeing that occupancy rates in our sector are about 10% higher than hotels. Prior mm -hmm. to COVID, it would have been exactly the opposite. Um, and so we are seeing our sector recover quicker. Um, and we're seeing that consumers are choosing it because they want private space. Um, and I think we as an industry did a good job of communicating our cleanliness protocols and standards early on in the crisis. Um, uh, being a part of the, the Visit Britain Good to Go scheme um, and all of these types of things. And so that helped to build confidence. And then on top of that, just the fact that the product offers something different, you know, you get a whole apartment to stay in versus a small hotel room in a building full of other people who are also traveling. Um, and so I think inherently people are, are looking for those private options um, in a world where, you know, they, they don't want to um, put themselves at risk when they travel. Um, and so I think business travelers are seeing it as, as an, a much better option. Um, and I think as we come out of lockdown and as, as we look into 2021, I think we'll see more and more people choosing vacation rentals and choosing homestays in cities when they travel. Um, and I think this will probably look back in three or four years time and say that COVID is what made our industry uh, 
um, accelerate that pace of growth even faster. Um, so I look ahead to my business plans and I think, wow, we've got to get supply on because mm -hmm. the demand is going to be there next year. Um, and that's why partnerships like uh, Three Sloan Gardens, most people would say, well, isn't it crazy to launch an apart hotel in the middle of a, of a crisis? Well, absolutely not. It's the perfect time because we're launching it in a crisis that is that is accelerating the demand for that type of product. Um, and so I think there's huge opportunities out there. Um, and I think the next 12 to 24 months are going to be incredible for for the industry overall and, and hopefully for under the doormat within that. And I guess I guess talking about longer term trends, do you think, you know, with the restrictions that we've had in place, but this idea of staycation and the growth of the UK travel tourism industry, is that here to stay? And does that sort of broaden out your plans um, with wider UK coverage? Absolutely. I mean, um, it's here to stay. Um, I think people are discovering their own country and realizing how wonderful it is. Um, and I, I, I don't think that it will instantaneously go back. I mean, airlines are projecting 2024 to get back to the levels of pre-COVID travel. Um, so I think staycation is here to stay. Um, I think that's good news for Britain because actually traditionally, uh, British people spent more money traveling abroad than the inter international tourism that came in. So actually, that should mean overall growth of the industry. Um, and, you know, it will mean different destinations. Um, so I think for us, uh, being able to work with a lot of the holiday homes destinations across the UK in the Hospiria model is critical to our growth and being able to offer the product that consumers want across the UK. Um, and I think that um, what it also will mean is that you're going to see um, consumers choosing that mix of product in, in a slightly different way. So, you know, they may still take a long holiday abroad, but they may do shorter breaks rather than going to other cities across mm -hmm. Europe in, in the UK. And I think that's going to be good in the recovery for places like London. Um and I guess also talking about just the business dynamics, you know, with COVID, it's clearly up the level from a health and hygiene perspective. But as chair of the Short Term Accommodation Association, do you embrace these changes because it continues to align with your motto of, of I guess, professionalism in this sector? Um, I mean, absolutely. I've, I've always been a big believer, you know, it's great when a new industry emerges, you know, you kind of have that cowboy phase of, of an industry, just like, you know, when, when people, you know, were pioneering in, in, in North America and in the US. And then over time, things have to professionalize. Um, you know, when you've got uh, young millennials that are, are traveling and they don't care about what the quality is of their accommodation and they're willing to take that risk, the peer-to-peer -peer model works really well. Um, but as soon as you start to become mainstream, and I think our industry is now mainstream, you know, mm -hmm. in 2018 already, uh, more than 10% of, of stays in London were in homes. Um, so it's no longer just uh, a, an alternative on the side that young people are doing. Um, and so people expect the same quality and standards of the other alternatives they have, hotels, service departments, et cetera. Um, and so I think the only way the industry is gonna to grow to its full potential is through that professionalization. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's important to have these standards. And in a way, I'm actually quite happy because COVID meant that standards became something visible to consumers. You know, prior to that, they didn't really think about it. They're like, well, it has a five star review. It's fine. Um, and they never really thought about cleanliness standards in the homes that they were that they were booking. And I think actually that mind shift has changed in a consumer in the consumer's mind. And at the end, consumers are what's going to change an industry. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that consumer demand is critical um, to the professionalization of the industry. And I think it means that the professional side of our industry is probably going to grow quicker um, in, in the recovery phase. Um, and I think a lot of individual owners and things like that are also realizing that to do it properly, you actually need to work with a company who does this day in, day out. 
So I think what we'll also see is some people who tried to do it peer to peer who realized it was actually a lot more work than they thought. Um, and also mm -hmm. that meeting these standards is, is more challenging than what they were used to. Um, we'll probably actually shift over to the professional side and, and choose to work with companies who can deliver it for them. Great. I guess focusing on the consumer, um, you know, environmental, social and governance factors are clearly on the main stage now. And I'd say this year you've clearly embraced the social responsibility of the NHS programs. But as an ambassador for your industry, uh, what is your opinion in terms of the positive impact you could create uh, for the sector and the direction of that in those three pillars? I mean, look, from my point of view, from a sustainability aspect, actually, our sector is pretty clear, you know, even from the point of view of, you know, why would we use land to build new hotels when we have homes that sit empty for various parts of the year? Um, better use that land to build housing so we have affordable housing for people um, and then whenever people aren't using those homes they get rented out um, that just means that you're using the same assets um, 365 days a year um, rather than having some assets which were used as hotels and then a bunch of other assets which are used as homes and sit empty for for large portions mm -hmm. of time so even at that very fundamental level, our industry is about sustainability. Um, now, obviously, we can also talk about, you know, removing plastics from the toiletries and all these other kinds of things. Um, and I think our industry, like everyone, is embracing those, those types of things. Um, but I also think that um, it's important when we look at the growth of the industry that we do so responsibly. Um, yeah. And I think that's where in the conversations with government, we talk about having standards, consumer protection, all these types of things, um, making sure that the right health and safety is in, in the properties that are being rented out um, so that consumers who go and stay are sure that they're not going to have a disaster. Um, you know, all of those types of things are really critical um, because I think if we want to reach the potential of the industry and you know 52 billion in the uk by 2025 we've got a lot of work to do over the next couple of years to make sure that um the industry is giving back to the community um i think nhs homes was a start to that um, but i think what's going to be more critical in the next 12 months is that in an economic crisis is the time when owners may be having difficulty that somebody in the family may have lost a job. Um, that ability to earn an income from your home when you're not using it is a critical way for people to have an alternative income source. So I think that in and of itself can be something really important to, um, to the UK over the next 12 months. Um, and I also think that it's gonna be really important to local businesses. Um, because when somebody comes and stays in a home, they also spend money in all the local shops and restaurants mm -hmm. nearby. Um, and so tourism growth and, you know, spreading that across a wider range of, of locations means that local businesses are going to benefit from our industry as well. Um, and we know that local shops, restaurants, all of these businesses are suffering in the crisis. And the more that we can do to help drive business back to those outlets and, and, and to those entrepreneurs in many cases is going to be critical to their survival and success in the future. So I think there's a whole uh, there's a whole range of different ways that our sector is going to play a role. Um, but given the size that our industry already is and the likely growth that we're going to see over the next 12 to 24 months, um, I think we've got a huge role to play not just in our sector recovering and the jobs that that creates, but also in helping other sectors that are related and, and the owners who might need the income. I think, you know, just as we come towards the end of this part of the discussion, um, you know, looking back on your journey from the start to where you are present day, what, what advice would you give to, your, to yourself uh, back then in terms of the challenges you face and how would you sort of, advise yourself going forward? <laughs> um, it's, it's really funny because when I started, other entrepreneurs said to me, you know, it will take you twice as long and cost you twice as much money to get where you mm. want to be. 
Um, and of course, as an optimistic and, um, you know, uh, aspiring entrepreneur, I sort of thought, well, you know, I can do better than that. Um, and, you know, it, it, it must just be that they found it hard, but, you know, I'll, I'll try and be smarter and do things in a better way and, and get there quicker. Um, and I think the reality is no matter what you do and no matter how smart you are and how good you are and all these other things, um, you know, it is tough. I think make sure that when you when you start out on this journey, you've got people around who can support you because it is a roller coaster. There are great days, there are tough days um, and everything in between. Um, and it will be something that is all consuming in your life if you want to succeed in it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people say, oh, it's great. You don't have a boss, uh, but you've got customers, you've got um, pros prospective partners, you've got all these other people who are demanding of you. Um, and you have even more pressure to deliver because you have people who've invested in you who you want to make sure that you deliver for. Um, so, you know, it's not an easy path, but it is an absolutely rewarding one um, and the best decision I ever made. I guess maybe just touching on that in terms of, you know, the dedication, it's not an easy path, but it's very rewarding. How do you take the time off to turn off, to give yourself some breathing space? Yeah, what are your, what's your advice on that? I mean, take regular holidays. Um, it also gives your team the space to step up when you're not there leading things. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's important. Um, I mentioned early on that triathlon was something I started just before I became an entrepreneur. And it's probably one of the things that's kept me sane throughout because just having that time where you disconnect and you go on a bike ride or on a run and, you know, keeping yourself healthy, but also keeping yourself mentally balanced, I think is actually really, really important. Um, and you'll find actually in the entrepreneurial community, there's a lot of people who do sport. Um, okay. I think there's a good reason why, um, because, you know, you need that way to just kind of let off some steam, relax. Um, you know, uh, I, I think it's probably relaxing for type A personalities. Um, <laughs> Um, and, you know, and, and to just disconnect um, and take a break from things so that when you come back, you've got a fresh mind um, and, and you've got that thinking to make sure that you're always top of your game. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to be speaking to you. And um, I guess at this stage of the discussion, we'll open it back up uh, to Homegrown and Karishma. Absolutely. Thank you both. That was such an insightful discussion. Really enjoyed that journey. And, you know, the, the highs, the lows, the opportunities. I think one thing that I took away from it, I have to be honest, was doing the right thing has led to so many opportunities. And really thinking about it in that way, being able to, and I think I mentioned about this whole idea about reinvention and resilience. Um, so Merrily, I've, I've been avidly writing notes because I just found it absolutely fascinating. We have got some, and actually you covered so many different topics. We have got questions. I'm going to, I'm going to read them out, but I actually think you've covered so many of those already. So one of the ones that came up was what role does sustainability play in your overall strategic plan? And actually you've talked about, um, you know, making those opportunities about converting houses that are, stand, that are say, laying dormant and being able to then leverage those, involving the government, making this into an industry-wide and a more impactful, wide-reaching conversation to really make it long-standing for the future. But if there's anything else that you'd like to add to that question, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, look, I think sustainability is, is is really important in any industry. And, you know, I think understanding what your strategy is, because mm. I think there's a lot of greenwashing out there. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it always frustrates me when I go to a hotel and they're like, oh, don't wash your towels and that's being sustainable. Well, yes, it helps. And like every little counts, I don't want to just dis disregard yeah. it completely. Um, but I think you've got to have a much bigger and more impactful strategy um, around any industry to, to truly be sustainable at its heart. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's why for me, looking at it really from almost a city planning perspective is probably gonna have a bigger impact overall in the long term than you know, whether, you know, whether you use plastic containers for your toiletries. Um, and so I think you need both and, uh, and both are absolutely important. 
Um, but I think you've got to, to have that, that really uh, high level strategy to sustainability um, to, to really make mm. an impact, which is going to be more than um, marginal, I think. Absolutely. And I think it's almost pave it. It's like laying the laying the groundwork so that other people can see the value that can be added to your point about, you know, basically starting out these conversations, thinking about what we've got, the assets that we've got laying dormant and then using those and recycling, whether it be housing, whether it be whatever it may be to kind of have have that knock on effect with other with other organizations within this sector, within this industry. And then to your point, which I found fascinating was that it doesn't just touch one industry, it then the repercussions expand even more it's like this whole ripple effect yeah um the other question actually and i think again um you'd covered was what's the future expectations for your business model now and with the covid19 impact yeah so i mean the future aspirations are that you know with the combination of the traditional under the doormat model and hosperia we want to build under the doormat into a global brand so yeah. That's absolutely the aspiration. Um, I think what changed over time is that, you know, it, already to the strategy that I talked about, sometimes you realize it's better to partner with people yeah. um, to get there. And I realized that, you know, if I want to be back in 42 countries around the world, I'm not going to be able to have a footprint myself in all of those places. Yeah. So the Hosperia strategy is really our international growth strategy. Um, and I think what's exciting about that is that, um, you know, we can actually turn on tomorrow supply in another market. Um, and so we're at the position now where we have that technology and we can do that. And it's now about rolling that out and, and making all of these small providers aware that that's an option and that it can help them grow their own businesses. And to your point, you're going into those local markets and you're actually helping local consumers to build their own businesses up. Um, and the other point on that, actually, that I found quite fascinating is also being able to spot those changes in consumer mindset, because ultimately that's going to play a big part in the way these businesses are run and how they how they operate. So to your point, people are looking to have that more homely feeling, be more in control of their own environment as a, you know, as a result of COVID, but also because people are feeling that little bit more homely, I think, and more kind of family orientated given everything that's happened. So, so I think I like the idea of, of kind of really taking note of all these little changes that are happening so that you, we're not going back to, you know, everyone talks about going back to this level of normality. Actually, there's a new normal coming. There's, an, there's all these changes in place that we have to kind of pivot ourselves and make it work for us going forward. No, um, absolutely. And I think one of the things that's really interesting, I mean, often people will probably have heard quoted uh, Churchill during the crisis, which is never let a good crisis go to waste. <laughs> um, and for me, it, it's kind of amazing because while we're in an industry which has been heavily impacted, I actually look back six months ago uh, at the business and I look at the business now and I'm so proud of what the team has done and, and how we've handled what could have been a devastating yeah. crisis on the business. And actually, I feel even stronger as a business. I feel like the opportunities are even bigger. Um, I feel like we've used this time in the best possible way to have a business that is in a really strong position yeah. to recover and actually, in the next two to three years, to be at a higher valuation and, and a larger business than what we'd actually planned six months ago, uh, which is kind of incredible to think that that would be possible. Um, and, and yet, you know, trusted stays wasn't even on the horizon at the beginning of the year. We now all of a sudden have a, an additional business model selling into government across the whole industry. Um, and so, you know, it, it's crazy, but if you, you know, where, whatever challenges are in front of you is you, if you can see them as opportunities, I think there are opportunities out there. And I think it's great to see having kind of tried our best to seize the opportunities that we could over this period. We're actually now finding that that was a really good thing to have done and that the business is stronger as a, as a result of it. 
Absolutely. And I think it's this kind of thinking um, that really can shift bigger organizations because and such as governments, because it's this kind of futuristic fluidity that actually can propose these different different scenarios that you wouldn't even imagine. And it's these positive stories that are needed. So I do thank you for, for bringing this to the table that everybody can have the opportunity to listen and to and to learn a little bit more. And I think in the environment that we're in, it really is about sharing those stories building these communities to, to be able to play it forward in their own roles and their own lives and their own businesses. Um, Absolutely. And I, I welcome, you know, there's a number of people who've been uh, listening on this call. Um, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn if there's ever anything I can do to help. There have been great people who helped me along the way. Um, and I think it's really important that, you know, we're all part of this community together. Um, so please feel free to reach out if there's something I can do to help as well. Amazing. Thank you, Merrily. I know Wealthy has certainly will be reaching out because I think that this story is fascinating and needs to be shared. Um, I think we're we're almost at time. Um, if there are any, if there aren't any more questions, I can leave Juice to to do a quick roundup from Wealthy Her, from all of us. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Merrily Dawn, you were amazing. Um, so really, really, really value the conversation. I've got all of my takeaways, by the way. So <laughs> I'll be using those going forward. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Karishma, for organizing this and Don for hosting this. And Merrily, a great story. Uh, it's all about the community indeed. And we have that the same in Homegrown. You see the entrepreneurs and the investors sticking really together during these times. And actually, a lot of people are thriving during this period as well, where they change their business towards, um, yeah, towards looking towards the future. Um, yeah, hope to welcome you in the, in the club um because i think our members um and our community will really benefit on on having you as a, a mentor around uh, as well so next time when we're out and about please uh, yeah come to marleba and uh, thank you all and next wealthy her breakfast i believe is on the 9th of december, 9th of december. um so watch this space and uh, see you then hopefully absolutely so, thank you very much thank right. you very much have a great day. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Thank you.